Okay, if I can just bring everybody to order and we'll make a start. Um, so, welcome everybody to um, this meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Management Board. Um, first of all, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Councillor Tony Dyer and I chair the Overview and Scrutiny Management Board. Councillor Mark Bradshaw is the Vice Chair of the Board. And then to my right, I have Stephen Peacock, Chief Executive. And to my left is Lucy Fleming, who keeps us all under control. Um, what I'm not going to go around and introduce everybody. When we get to each section, um, I'll allow people to introduce themselves. Um, and what I would say to councillors on the board, as you um, come in to, for the first time to ask a question or make a point, just quickly say who you are. Um, we don't have a uh, full video today. Uh, we, we do have audio, however, so while I'll ask you very nicely, please, to make sure you use your microphones when you ask questions. Um, Storm Kieran is having effects all across everywhere at the moment. So that's introductions. Uh, safety information. Um, if there is a fire alarm, we're not expecting one, but if there is a fire alarm, can you please leave by the, the two exits? Move up to the front, the main entrance of uh, the city hall. When you get onto the ramp, turn white and make your way towards Bristol Cathedral and then please wait to be signed off by a fire officer. Okay, apologies for absence, Lucy. Say again, Councillor Gollop's running a bit late. And also, just to say, uh, Stephen may have to leave. we we'll have to leave us at seven o'clock as well. And that is probably Councillor Gollop trying to get in. Okay, thank you everyone. Moving on to agenda item number three, declarations of interest. Do I have any declarations of interest for the meeting? So I am um, one of the council's nominated uh, directors of City League Joint Venture Company. So we'll get that on the record. Okay, thank you. And we'll note that. Okay, move on to agenda item number four, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, Councillor Andrew Brown. Uh, just to say, Chair, that in the, uh, in the minutes, I'm not listed as having attended that meeting, but I did. You certainly did. I remember it very well. Do we have any other comments on the, on the minutes? In that case, can I... Apart from that correction, can I take the minutes as approved? Thank you. Agenda item number five is chair's business. Um, I have no chair's business uh, today. Uh, so that moves us straight on to agenda item number six, which is public forum. Um, we have two questions from members of the public and one statement. And both members of the public are here. Um, so we'll go with question one first, which is by Dan Ackroyd. Dan, do you want to ask your question? You do. The, um, we will be having an open view, overview and scrutiny management board meeting and that report is expected to come to the overview and scrutiny management board. Um, at least part of that will be public, but that will be determined by myself in discussion with officers and the relevant people rather than being determined by the election period. 
Thank you, Dan. Second question is Sid Wine. So I said, I mean, the response is, do you have a supplementary question rather than a statement? So what's the question, please? I'll refer that to the relevant officer. Um, just the other thing I was going to say is, in the response to question three, um, what I did say in the response was that, and I will say it, is that the metric you have done, identified is the one currently being scrutinized by the ICO with their practice recommendations. With no other concerns raised by them around the application of other provisions, as chair, I am satisfied with the continued use of this metric. I'm also reluctant to recommend expanding the capture of new metrics as the improvement plan is unfunded, as you identified. Therefore, this would divert resources from supporting the improvements required. The reason why I've read that back is because at the end I say, I note, however, that other OSMA members may disagree, and I am happy to, if any other OSMA member wants to make a, a comment. Councillor Steve Smith. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I, I just think... Um, as, as Sid said, if, I'd be surprised if we don't already have data on, for example, how many requests are refused, how many of those refusals are then challenged, and how many are challenged successfully. If that data already exists, then I can't imagine it would be particularly difficult or expensive to include it in the performance report. If, it, you know, if it's going to create a massive amount of work to do it, then I'd agree, but it should already be there. Okay, thanks. Um, with your permission, I'll add that to Sid's uh, Edo comment and we refer that to the relevant officer for response. Thank you. Councillor Fodor. Ah, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think the issues here and in the statement are, are important because, um, you know, the issues with performance metrics and indicators and, and sort of monitoring things is not that you can monitor them necessarily, it's that you can monitor something that's useful and shows that we're getting the outcome we want. And if the outcome is no one has to make FOI uh, inquiries because the information's there, then we want it to be as low as possible, for instance. If we want to say when they do ask it, they get the reply they need because we're cooperative, then we want something that indicates that. And I know it's difficult to get some data, uh, but as, as was said, there could well be appropriate data, but what matters is that we, we get the outcomes that are positive for transparency and responsiveness to the public, and, and I hope we can do that. Thank you. Okay, Sid, you also have a statement. Um, you do have a minute. Um, your statement's quite long, so you might want to do your best to paraphrase it down to a minute. <laughs> Okay, thank you, no problem. Okay, before I move on to item number seven, I've just realized that I've been incredibly rude because we have a new member of OSM and I failed to uh, properly welcome them to the uh, committee. Um, as you will know, Councillor Steve Pearce uh, is now acting mayor um, and in that capacity is no longer able to be on the overview and scrutiny management board. So we have Councillor Tim Rippington is joining us. Um, uh, welcome aboard, Tim. Um, if any of the other councillors don't play nicely, let me know. Um, but you're very welcome to join us. And with that, we are going to move on to agenda item number seven, which is the Bristol Beacon. Um, I'm going to hand over to John first, um, and then uh, Pete and possibly... Uh, too many Andersons in this. Uh, 
the other Anderson, James, and then uh, Louise may also want to, uh, to add a few words as well. So over to you, John. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, good evening, everybody. Smith. I'm the Executive Director for Growth and Regeneration at the Council. My colleague is Chair Jeff Danson, who's the head of the project team. Welcome, Louise Mitchell as well, who's the Chief Executive of uh, Bristol Music Trust. So um, we are going to share the time answer questions as usual. The slides are just limping up, so um, I don't mind just kicking off. Oh, there we go. Great. Thank you. So, um, I, uh, councillors, I, we thought we'd just run through, uh, first of all, a little bit of the background and context. Obviously, with this project, there's an awful lot of background and context, but um, I th thought particularly as this is a public meeting, we just summarise uh, some of the key elements of the, back, back of the background. We're then going to give a, a brief update on, on the latest position, particularly on arrangements with Bristol Music Trust. Uh, I'm then going to hand over to my colleague James, who's going to uh, talk us through the timeframes and key milestones of the programme and where we are, uh, and an update on the, on the wider project. Um, and then um, Louise is, is just going to give a, a little bit of an update on where we are in terms of preparations for, for opening next month. This month. So, forgive me. <laughs> that that wasn't a, a, an update on a on a, on a, on a timetable <laughs> slip. That was a slip by me. So yes, this month. Thank you, colleagues. Okay, um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. So um, just in terms of the background, the Bristol Beacon is obviously a, a Bristol City Council-owned freehold asset. It's been operated since 2011 by the Bristol Music Trust, which is an arm's length trust. Um, the there was a detailed paper that was approved by cabinet in January. Uh, that was to proceed with the completion of the Bristol Beacon project at a total cost of 131.9 million pounds and a total BCC of Bristol City Council contribution of 83.9 million pounds. The paper also referred to the earlier KPMG report uh, that summarized the economic contribution of a restored Bristol Beacon at somewhere between 325 and 412 million pounds over a 20 year period. Um, it is worth, I'm not, as I said, I'm not gonna to dwell too much on the history, but the, the cost things I've just set out there are, are a significant increase from the original uh, capital plan. Uh, originally, uh, the council was gonna make a contribution of 10 million out of a total budget of 49 million. So this is obviously a significant change caused primarily by uh, factors that have affected all projects of this type, such as inflation, but also by the particular circumstances of the, the fabric of, of the Bristol Beacon building. Um, so, it, of course, uh, everyone knows that, that those uh, challenges have come at a time of significant financial pressure for the council as well. Um, so the other amount of context I wanted to say that uh, we, we've been in significant discussion with uh, Bristol Music Trust about how to best structure the ongoing arrangements with them given that significant change in the nature of the project. So there, there have been a number of discussions uh, about the relationship and how we can work together going forward. So I'm delighted that uh, several weeks ago now we reached agreement in principle about how we're going to work with the Trust going forwards, uh, very much focused on achieving our opening date of the 30th of November this month. So this is clearly uh, an important moment uh, you know, for the council and the city uh, to have Bristol Beacon open again out of a period of several years. And it is something that we've worked in partnership with Scrutiny Audit and, and Audit uh, colleagues throughout that, that period. So I was just gonna deal with the high level of the uh, elements of the heads of terms, which we've gone on to, that's great, thank you. That's that one, uh, thank you. Um, so the, the key element of the agreement that we've reached um, with, with uh, the Bristol Music Trust is that we are no longer going to pay uh, a revenue subsidy on an ongoing basis to the trust. That is a saving of some uh, three million pounds to the council. We've also agreed that um, there will be an eight million deemed sum which will be repaid by BMT from uh, surplus subject to agreed criteria. We've also agreed uh, and built on the existing open book accounting 
uh, and an engagement through the BMT board. The other two elements of, of the terms listed there, which I'd flag, is that if after two years the Bristol Music Trust is unable to meet its commitments, we've agreed that we will sit down with them and, and with uh, funders and review the operating model. Uh, and we have also um, uh, agreed with them, and in fact, I should say this has been welcomed by the Trust, that they will annually uh, come and, and, and account to, to, to the Council and, and to the City about... Uh, how things are going at, at uh, BMT. So those are the key elements of the existing relationship uh, or the future relationship that I wanted to set out. So we don't mind moving on to the next one. I'm going to hand over uh, to James now to talk about uh, where we are. So, <coughs> sorry. So I just included this just to provide a couple of key marketing dates which are worth noting. At the point we started, the official opening night is the 30th of November and we are on target to do so. That is the first large part. Um, the, the kind of the other, the other one that really that I wanted to flesh out here is that there is a two year grace period uh, to allow the Bristol Mutual Trust to establish their building, uh, after which um, the repair So I thought I'd give you a, an update on the project. So the, the project is, has never been in a better state than it is now. There is huge amounts of activity happening on site with hundreds of people applying finishing touches across the building. Um, all of the building systems are being, have, well, have been installed and are being commissioned at the moment. So being brought online. So all of the life safety, arms, uh, technical systems and so on. Um, there is support in place to provide the Bristol Music Trust soft landing as we move through the, uh, the autumn season into the spring because uh, inevitably we've got the resource and support on site so that the experience for the public is the best it can possibly be. Um, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll let you speak to this when you come through, but sure. the, the feedback is that, that, you know, the building is something really special and it will be a really, really significant for the people in Bristol. Um, so, so that's the, the sense that we're getting. Uh, test events are being carried out now. So there are people going into that building um, in a controlled manner, uh, allowing the Bristol to uh, test how the systems work, getting people in and out, getting a sense of how the building's gonna manage. But it's really given us a real sense of, um, uh, of how close it is, it is to an opening and, uh, and really positive to see. Um, You've probably got, I think, 900 people attending for uh, this. Yeah. Most of them very young. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have got a lot of uh, junior string players coming this weekend. Yeah. Um. So, uh, so, so and I think I, I've, I've finished up there by saying I think we're in a place now where the relationship between the, the BMT and the council is in a really good position. Um, there's a sense that we, we know where we are, mm -hmm. and, um, and we're working towards a, a joint end goal here. Now, I've put some photos in. Now, this, I, I put this together two weeks ago. So I, I re looked at these photos just a minute ago, and I've realized that they now look quite old, because things are moving really quickly. Um, you may have seen on social media from Mr. Beacon, there's actually photos up of, of a band on that stage now, and people in the stadium, in, this, in, the, in the seating. So, um, so uh, I just wanted to give you that as a sense that the building is really coming together and, uh, and hopefully you will have received some invites uh, to, to the opening. Okay. Great shot. Okay. Yeah, please do. Good. I suppose, uh, hi, I'm Louise Mitchell, Chief Executive at Bristol Beacon. I suppose I'm here to personify the fact that we have a good relationship with our colleagues at Bristol City. And before I say anything else, I say a profound thank you on behalf of the trustees and staff at Bristol Music Trust and indeed all the musicians of Bristol and the South West, I realised that it was not an easy decision and it was a very difficult 
set of circumstances that made it possible for you to um, vote the funds to finish this building. I can also say that it looks absolutely amazing. Um, we had people on the weekend practicing, uh, as James has said, and they all just said it's so beautiful. So I don't think anybody will go in there and say, well, where's our money gone? Um, it functions really well. Um, we're very proud of it. Looking forward to producing great events for the City of Bristol. We take our civic responsibility very seriously. We're there for all people and all, all kinds of music, and we look forward to welcoming you. I would do a little housekeeping thing at this stage. We have invited every councillor uh, to the 30th of November. Um, some of the invitations got received by the server. If anybody has tried to go through and weed out people who haven't replied, but if anybody has not had their invitation, Please let me know personally, and I'll make sure they get sorted out. There is an allocation of tickets. We're not trying to keep you out. It's just that, that your server is a little bit uh, particular about who. Um, but there is a huge sense of excitement within the city for some of the events coming up. Um, we've got everything from the London Symphony Orchestra to Adam Ant, uh, the Snowman, um, to all sorts of other things, and a lot of work uh, with young musicians, as personified by the by the events we've got over this weekend, which are technically test events, um, but uh, will allow us to open our doors to to young musicians, which is really what we're there for. Um, we've got over two million pounds in the bank of ticket sales at the moment, um, so it's looking really promising. Um, and we look forward to working with our colleagues in the council um, in future years to deliver a great return for the city. Thank you. Um, I now hand over to councillors for uh, comments or questions. So I'll start with Councillor Smith, Councillor Gollop, Councillor Townsend. Thank you very much. Um, just before I launch, you know, in context, I think this, this is an amazing cultural asset for the city. I'm really looking forward to going on the opening and beyond, and I, I wish Louise and team all the very, very best with it, because it's going to be amazing. Um, however, in terms of taxpayers' money, it's perhaps a, a less happy story where we stand at the moment. Um, I just want to dig in a little bit to the, the deemed sum that, that's in there in the repayment plan. Um, a couple of few questions. First of all, where, where did the deemed sum come from? Was it simply a negotiated position that 8 million was a reasonable amount, or is there something behind that figure? Um, can you, appreciating we're not in a, an exempt session here, but can you tell us what the conditions are, or the criteria are, for repayment of that sum? And can you give us, it's crystal ball gazing a little bit, but a, a view as to the likelihood of getting that, all of it, or some of it, you know, is it a maybe, or probably, or a certainly? Yes, Councillor, happy, happy to, to do that. So the first thing to say is, as we reported, it is the current situation. So those are the headline principles we've agreed, and there are some details we're working through. But I mean, that does, won't stop me giving a, an answer to the to the questions. Um, so the first thing is, um, where did the deem sum and that amount come from? It was based on an original structure that was in the original agreement. So we've tried as as far as possible to stick with uh, with that sort of concept. So it was to do with the amounts which may not have originally been funded by the by uh, BMT and, and there was an underwriting by the, the council of that. So it doesn't re actually relate to the amount which, which, uh, you know, which, which wasn't funded by BMT, but, um, but that, that was the idea that we took the concept and the amount from something that was in the original deal. Um, so forgive me. So the second one was then what, on, on what basis on which it's going to be repaid? I think the key thing to say is that it is only paid in any particular where there is a surplus. Um, that is achieved by the trust, and that is after ensuring that there are sufficient um, reserves uh, in, in the accounts, isn't it, Louise? Mm -hmm. so, and and the, the amount doesn't roll up from year to year, so there's, a, there's an assessment made on each year about uh, the surplus. If in any particular year they had, um, I'm not sure what the right phrase is, Council, but a bumper year, and, and, and there was a, an amount available above the, the repayment amount, then there is a, an ongoing sharing between the principle is that we would share that as well, but it, you know it, it's not something that would roll up so there was a massive amount unpaid if there wasn't a surplus in any particular year. So that's the, that's probably the key criteria. Um, that's the second point. Sorry, there was a third point, Councillor. Yeah. Maybe probably 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to comment and probably let Louise comment as well. So, so Louise referred to the fact that the, the, the venue has been shut for, for quite a long time and indeed it's been an uncertain period for this type of business in general. Um, we have had various reviews and we have obviously been and talked, Chair, to you about those, which suggests that, you know, the, the way that the trust has been set up um, there isn't scope for a huge amount of additional earnings to be made. Um, so we're not expecting uh, BMT to make massive profits. Um, so, you know, I think we'd have to be cautious about it. But what we've worked very closely together, and certainly Louise has, has been very clear about, they're going to work very hard to try and deliver a, a return for the city, you know, on their operations, but subject to all of that uncertainty. And bearing in mind the charitable status of the trust and the uncertainty, we you know, we didn't think it was appropriate to, to give a sort of underwritten or guaranteed sum. It just, um, it wasn't, wasn't appropriate. But we built those mechanisms and processes in place. So if it looks at, at a period that there isn't going to be a significant return paid, we, we have agreed that we'll sit down and look at the operating model as well. Councillor Gollop. Yeah, I'm just thinking I represent the same ward doesn't mean we, we talk beforehand. none of you would expect it to do that. The, the first question I want to ask for, for, for you, John, um, is if Yes. Jeff, is your microphone on? Let's try this one. Um, so the, the, the comment about contract before the opening night, I sort of have visions of John and Louise missing the concert because they're actually going to be still arm wrestling over clauses in the agreement. It, it, it all sounds a bit like sort of EU negotiations. And, and I, I, I sort of like to think that it was going to be done well in advance of that and realising that we're only about four weeks away now, um, I'm just concerned. And uh, is that going to be resolved in an amicable way? I mean, I, I, I'm very clear. Louise and I sat down and thrashed these out, and, and we've agreed the key terms. Um, I, I hope we will convert it into a, a fully binding contract by then, but um, and you know, we're working very hard to do that, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> it, it's not a... Um, it would not be cataclysmic if it followed in the week after. The contracts in place are perfectly adaptable to run the, run the building. Leases will be in place. Everything's in place. Um, we've given ourselves that target date to give us something to shoot for. Yeah. Jeff, okay, you now have gone from can, zero to two. So. <laughs> Sorry? Well, that one's turned off now. Oh. Um, so that's very, that's very positive to hear. But I wanted to also ask about the, 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 the deemed sum, because the deemed sum is a very small sum in relation to the total cost that the authority is paying out. Um, now, if I, if I believe all I've heard about Louise's capabilities, I've no doubt that Louise will achieve, manage to achieve significantly more than the deemed sum. Um, and, and it just, that, that seems to me a, a sort of a, a conundrum because what would have been totally wrong if we had hoist a, a phenomenal liability on the music trust that they were going to have to pay each year. But if they're as successful as I believe they should be with this venture, I would hope we would be seeing more than the deemed sum coming back. So I have a question about how that can be achieved but I'd link that in with my uh, final question for now um, which is about the valuation rather than the economic valuation of the building 
because the notes to the authorities' accounts in past years have effectively said that any spend on the Bristol Beacon had to be written off because of the peppercorn rent uh, over the 30-year period. So what will be the carrying value of the Bristol Beacon? Will it reflect the money that's been spent or will it in fact reflect the, the, the value of a peppercorn rent for 30 years? Uh, thank you. Uh, so, Councillor, I mean, you may be right about future returns. Uh, I, I, I hope you are, that uh, the venue is a complete success and that happens. I mean, we have reached agreement on the terms as we have at the moment. There's nothing to stop us having future discussions, uh, if that is the case, about how we work together. Clearly, we'll still be the freeholder and BMT will still be uh, the, the, the operator on that basis. So, uh, But we're not proposing to make any further variations at this stage. I think we'd both have perhaps severe palpitations if we did, Louise. Um, so in terms of your second point, um, it, it's something, it would be a matter of how it's dealt with in the council. We'll have to follow up with the finance uh, uh, team, uh, Councillor Gollum. So we, we will do that, of course. I'm, I'm not aware of any change uh, currently anticipated, but we'll, we, we will go around that point with them and, and get you an update. So I, I, if, if Fosm could have some clarity on that, because I'm guessing that has to be... That, has, that will be being resolved as part of the, the, the 2023 accounts. So maybe already is resolved, but it, but I would like some. I I would like, and I think other members would like some clarity on that. Thank you, Councillor Townsend. Is it working? Okay. Um, first thing, I want to make a point about what Louise said, Louise. Um, you thanked us for supporting. It was the Labour's mayor that supported um, as an opposition councillor. I, I wasn't consulted and I had no input into the decision. And I want to make that really clear um, that it wasn't a full council decision to, um, to take out the, this enormous loan um, that is now being paid back by the Bristolian taxpayer. Um, so my, my question then long the debt servicing or the peppercorn lease that's my first question my second question is in relation to this eight million pounds uh this amount of eight million pounds don you described it as the original deal what do you mean by the original deal because in my mind the original deal was 10 million that bristol city council was putting in so when you said original deal, when Bristol was putting in 10 million, was he expecting to get 8 million back? The reference to 8 million is that in the original um, uh, agreement, which went to cabinet, so you can go back to the original decision um, taken in 2018, 2019, thank you, 2018, um, we underwrote, so it was part of the original arrangement that we underwrote the fundraising efforts that would be made by the Bristol Music Trust. So the council's capital commitment was 10. There was, a, there was an underwriting which was all set out in the original paper. So I think John's referring to that original, that original concept, but using it in effect to provide some sort of underwrite, uh, under, underpinning principle that is now being turned into the new deal. So we always had that in the original agreement. Right, can I, can I, okay. So what you're saying then is that it was 10 million capital originally with a further 8 million that underwrote fundraising from the Bristol Music Trust, is that correct? Well, it's not what I'm saying now, it's what the original deal was yeah, in yeah, 2018. Yeah. yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah. Right, okay. And so now we're at the point where that eight million underwriting is almost irrelevant because we've taken out multi million pound additional funding to underwrite the redevelopment. So, so your so your question I, I, I guess I'm quite interested to know what the real question is because at, at every stage I think what we had to do was to look at the alternative to progressing. So the administration obviously, as you quite rightly said, made those decisions. So both in 2019, when the, I think the first increase, because you talked about rev subsequent revisions, there have been three. Uh, Council Gorob's right, I think it was a 48 to 52 million, as I recall. 
um, and then it was a 52 to 106. So we can all see it's been revised a number of times, but at every point, and some of the members will remember we had some exempt sessions where we looked at the kind of the do, don't do scenario on every occasion. And on every occasion, because we are the freeholder and because this is a listed building, the alternative always looked worse than carrying on. So the original deal was a reference point, nothing more. What we've done is we've taken 84 million, we've, talk, we've talked to the trustees, we've talked to the Arts Council, who have held us to the commitments that a previous administra administration made in 2011, which would see this council pay money back to the Arts Council if we stopped. And so everything has had to be looked at afresh. And it's about where we can strike a balance between the going concern of a charity which we set up as an authority in 2011, which was, would have been jeopardized by going any further than we did. And we pushed very hard. Again, also members have heard um, from me and from other members here, other count officers here, about what, what we were trying to achieve in that negotiation. And it was a very difficult conversation that involved the trustees, the chairs, and the chief, deputy chief executive of the Arts Council. We, we, we pushed as far as we could, but at the end of the day, this is the council's asset. We have responsibilities. And now, regardless of how it's characterized in our books, we do have a functioning economic asset which will bring in people into our city. So your question about the eight million is, we used it and it's now a different eight million because effectively it's, it's, a, it's an arrangement that was never envisaged five years ago. It's a new deal. Uh Councillor, I'm happy to respond to the other question as well. So we, in the, the um, original uh, report, or sorry, I should say the October 2022 Council report, there was the information about the borrowing, which we shared with you previously, about on the basis on which that was done. So that is under the uh, Public Works and Loans Board loan process, and that's a f that is accumulated and written off over a 50-year period. Um, the lease is a 30-year period, the peppercorn lease. Right, okay, thank you. And I have one more question. Um, in the timeline, there's a, a two-year grace period. Is that the period whereby there's nothing coming back from the BMT, even if the money's made? Or is, that, is it another two years on top of that? So in effect, there's, a four, there's four years before anything comes back. So the... It's, it's probably slightly more than two years, isn't it? So it, there's, a, there's a stub period from November to, um, to March, and it's two years from March. I think it's fair to, that's right, isn't it? So, so sorry, it's slightly more than two years. Uh, but there's no two plus two, so it is just two years. So if at that point it doesn't look like there's going to be a repayment, we can sit down and talk about a different model. And that's the two years that's mentioned in here in terms of the business yes. model? That's right. Okay. So it would be two years from next March. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wilcox. I do have three other councillors lined up. So. Thank you, Chair. He has already asked my question about the grace period because I was confused about that. Uh, but thank you. Um, I wonder if you could expand on the phrase that soft landings for BMT that you use on page 19 because you're not running an airline, you're running a musical. Sorry, it's my fault for you. It's a, te it's a term that's often used in construction projects, uh, whereby uh, when you hand over a new asset, you make sure you have people on hand who might have installed or have built the operating equipment that is within the building, so that when inevitably the gremlins turn up and things aren't connected properly or something fails, there's somebody there who understands the equipment, has been trained on it, probably gave the training on it, and can fix it quickly and reliably and support the staff. So what we've done is we've made sure that for the, for the things where we think there is uh, areas of risk, where the, if, there was a, if there was a failure, it would be quite catastrophic, we've made sure we've got people there who can support BMT and make sure that the experience for Bristol citizens is the best it can be. I think the, uh, the other term used for something similar is snagging. Yes, I can understand that. Well, that's different. That's uh, that's sorting out all the cracks and the dents and the chips. This is this is much more um, much more hands on. And and was that cost budgeted for in terms of what the Bristol Council's contribution is, or is that? It's all part of the capital cost of the project. Um, we've we've rolled it into the professional support that we've we've 
procured for the, for the, uh, for the capital project. Okay, so within thank the you. Budget, so within the budget. Right. <laughs> and, it, and we are within our budget. Councillor Fodor. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Um, you know, I, I do look forward to Bristol having, uh, you know, this important asset back, back fully operational. I was there at something just earlier, and it definitely looks busy. There's lots of people clearly coming and going, getting it ready. Um, so that's reassuring. Um, I do have some questions, nevertheless, uh, about the the opportunity cost of what's been done and the sort of cultural implications relating to that. So uh, this was something I raised about three and a half years ago when we had briefings about the project. Um, and the opportunity cost is that the council has now sunk a phenomenal amount of money into this particular facility. And it's going to be wonderful and lots will happen there. That's, that's important. But the opportunity cost is it hasn't, it hasn't put money in and it won't now have money because it will be paying for this loan, uh, for all of the things elsewhere in Bristol, in that same sector or indeed in other sectors that need capital investment. So um, I think the same question arises because I was assured at the time that the success of this project would help fund culture around the city as well. If it's instead paying for the loan, it's not necessarily helping fund the smaller venues, the things that haven't had their new roof or the new auditorium or all the other things. So we need both because we need to nurture the talent on the ground in the neighbourhoods, not just in the, in the Bristol Beacon. I mean, some of it will happen in the Beacon, as you say, with young people that, and you know, diverse groups using it. But some of that stuff starts in the neighbourhood or in the, the local centres and in the smaller venues that can do things that aren't going to happen in the, in the sort of... Uh, city centre. Well, yeah. So, so there is this cult. There, there, there's an opportunity cost. Um, that's that's the first one. I've got another related one. So, if that's a question, um, the cost to the council of not progressing in 2020 would have been more expensive. A building wrapped in plastic, and a hole at the heart of our city. We would have spent more money to achieve that. So the only decision that was really possible, once this project had, once this building had revealed itself to us, and nobody here, nobody here is pleased with what we found collectively as the layers were peeled back. It was, it was at the extreme end of every builder's worst nightmare. And not to say, that not least their clients, builders tend to somehow shield themselves from the impact of finding bad things, but the client always pays. So once that had become a practical reality, once the building had closed, which it had to do, because we couldn't do any test drilling more than we did, and we, we exhaustively went through this with Osm in previous years, the, the, every turn, at every turn, we looked at what could, what could we do ex, except, you know, except carry on, because this is a huge amount of money. Nobody wanted to put this money in, but we were left with practically only worse choices throughout. Okay, thank you. So, so the, the answer is kind of it, it would have been worse with that, without this asset because we wouldn't have necessarily got um, others. But, I mean, my, my related question is uh, some of the outcomes now need, need to be social and cultural, um, not just in the beacon, though. So, so I'm interested in the social value that will be part of the return, but I'm also interested in, in whether there will be investment. So we haven't got, like, the head of culture here. We've got the head of capital projects here. To answer us so what would they be wanting to do with the return uh, if there is any after the after the, the debt so a couple of things so uh, as well as um, what the chief executive was saying I, I mentioned at the start council I think you're, you're well aware of this there is a wider economic contribution of having such a, a wonderful asset and, and all of the activities that happens in it and which was set out in the KPMG report some time ago so obviously that will provide value in itself um, the structure we've set up, though, is that you know we've set up a, a basis on which some, albeit you know, as Councillor Gollop I think said, it's a relatively small amount compared to the investment. You're not pretending otherwise, but um, that some money might be returned. There's, we've made no prejudgment about how that money would be applied. So, how that would be applied would be a, a decision for the administration at the time, as and when it accrues. So, it's, it's as simple as that from our point of view. We've I just set the, put the structure in place. Um, it, it is probably worth stating the, um, 
the scale of the socially valuable activity that Bristol Music Trust is doing in our city, because we mustn't forget that the the purpose of BMT is charitable. And Denise, uh, Louise, I'm sure you can give some examples. And I know you brought your brochure in, didn't you? I mean, the the um, the thing in our st the, our story about this project, I believe, in hindsight, has missed one important ingredient, which is that we seem to have taken for granted uh, an organisation that is regarded nationally and ex as an exemplar in spreading, the, creating social value through, through arts and music. So that work probably would have been severely, if not terminally, impacted if we just came to a full stop with the Bristol Beacon. So let's not forget all that Bristol Music Trust is doing in our city around social value. Councillor Bradshaw. Oh, sorry, James. Sorry, I was just going to add to that, <clears throat> that um, the, the social value was in the last year of operation for the Bristol Music Trust uh, was, was measured using the Council Social Value Calculator, and it was delivering around eight and a half million pounds worth of social value across the city. So not from the, the, uh, the hall itself, but in terms of without the hall, education programs and outreach. So I thought that might be a useful, uh, a useful thing to, to note. It is in previous Osm minutes. I've included it as part of the information. I'm more than happy to resend it. Well, thanks. Thanks. That's reassuring because I don't just want it to be a commercial venue. I do want it to contribute all those other things. We've got a commercial theatre that does what's profitable, so we need these other dimensions too. Thank you. Councillor Bradshaw. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. So my start point is because of the of, of the scale of the investment by the city. Uh, the Beacon BMT must be a resource for the whole city, for all Bristolians, irrespective of where they live and their b backgrounds. So that's where I'm starting from, and I'm sure my colleagues feel the same. I've got two particular questions. The first is the yearly and two yearly, sorry, the yearly reviews and the two year milestone. That in, in my view, they've got to be proper and transparent processes, and I'm sure that they will be. So can we hear a bit more about how they will be conducted? Um, because they're obviously extremely important. And I, and I still maintain a view that I've expressed earlier in, in other meetings, that there is perhaps a need for a critical friend to work with BMT so that we don't end up with a situation that we hit the review and find there's a highly significant issue that needs to be addressed at that point. There's a continuous process, continuous dialogue, and I, and I think given the circumstances and given the scale of that investment by the city, the, an independent critical friend who has knowledge and expertise in this field could add value and could, and could assist. And my second point is about the long-term maintenance and upkeep of the building with the investment that's been made. It's not the end of it. There's a continuous process over the 30 or 50 years. So a, a little bit about the contingency and arrangements on, on, on that side of things, because it would be a shame to make all this investment to find that it's not well maintained over that period of time. Can I just quickly jump in? Because for one part of that, I was worried about what that model would look like in terms of the reporting back. Obviously, we're moving to a new system of governance, so I would imagine that would be something that would need to be ironed out by the next administration, along with uh, officers and uh, the Bristol Music Trust as well. It's just my quick take on that, but Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Chair. We deliberately left that a little bit vague, um, purely because we want it to be in public, Councillor, uh, but we assume it will be to one of the committees in the future committee structure, but for a future administration to agree with the trust. But the, the, the point was it would be in public and it would be obviously about uh, transparency from the trust, but also unashamedly for you to talk about all the work you're doing and all the good work that uh, Councillor Fodor was just talking about as well. It's a platform to do that as well. Um, so uh, that, that's the annual review, Councillor. In terms of the two-year review, um, that, that I think just refers to the fact that if after that two-year grace period, you know, we'd look at it and because and, at the moment we don't really know what the financial position is going to be given the uncertainty that we've set out. But at that point, we could at that, sit down and talk about what a future um, different alternative operating model would be. I think that would be something that, you know, we'd be looking at to, to, to discuss as a, as a council. 
obviously with the trust, but also we've agreed that it would be with significant funders, including the Arts Council, who obviously have a clear interest in it as well. But again, that would, I, I, I assume if I was involved in that at that time, that would be something I'd be doing in discussion with the administration at that time about how we did that. But again, it's given us a hook to have that conversation, really. Yeah, in terms of maintenance, uh, James is just going to summarise that for you. Yeah, no, quite happy to pick that up. So, um, so we have at the moment an agreement for lease with the Bristol Music Trust, which will come into effect after completion. Um, that lease is very specific about the responsibilities for maintenance of the building as a whole. Uh, there is some element which is retained by the council and the remainder is retained by the Bristol Music Trust. Our corporate landlord is fully aware and put into preparation uh, plans for the long-term maintenance, which is limited really to, to, to the roof, in effect, clearing the roof. Um, and, and Bristol Music Trusts have, have their responsibilities for the, for the remainder. Um, but uh, we're, very, we're very aware of it, and we're making sure that it's addressed properly. If I could quickly come back, my, my point on the review is it should be a proper and transparent process. I wasn't looking to design it here. It's not, it's not our role. But I do, I, do, you know, I, I do hope that you will consider the notion of a critical friend, if that's the correct term, because I think it could add some value here. That's the, the friend bit. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as, a, as an independent charity, we are scrutinised by the directors by the, by the Arts Council and by a significant number of um, If that's something the council wishes to instigate, then we'll, we'll have that discussion quite happily. Well, Councillor Whippington next, and then Councillor Brown, and then I'll come back to you, Councillor Wilcox, because you've already had a go. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Louise, thank you for the invitation to the opening. Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to come, and I'm probably the only councillor here who can say that the reason for that is I'm going to be playing a gig in London on the same night. Um, but that does mean that I have a great interest in the the musical value of this this building particularly. Um, and I'm really interested to hear what you what you'd say about the other way, you know, other than the big events that you're going to have there, the other ways that you're going to use it to inspire sort of musicians and people like that within the city. Um, I've also got an autistic son and I noticed that you're doing quite a lot of um, stuff around um, sort of music courses for, for disabled people and stuff. And I'm hoping you're going to be doing that in, in the Beacon. So because your, your surroundings do inspire, don't they? Um, people so if you if they can get into so I'm interested to hear that um, I do also have a finance question because that's you know everybody has to have one of those um, John you mentioned the revenue um, subsidy that of, and I think you said three million is that something that we were paying before uh, and if so when did we stop presumably we've stopped paying that because because it's not been going but is that three million annually that we would be getting uh, back essentially there was an original profile that was set out on the in, we talked about the original deal council quite a few times so there was an original deal which set out all of these things which you know given the circumstances and the increased contribution from the council we've renegotiated effectively but no there was an, an annual profile of payments that we were that we were so to we make were going out going yeah it it, it 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 wasn't three million a year that was that was three million total over, over the period okay. so it 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 was um, I'm trying to remember that was something it like down? yeah it tapered down from something like five hundred thousand a year over a period. So is that right? Okay. If I can reassure you um, about uh, the the breadth of program, and we've chosen to open um, with the local or you know the nationally profiled local. program belongs here as well as being of international significance. I uh, draw your attention to the second event, which is the Saturday, the second, uh, which we call the housewarming. And I think there are something like 50 different uh, community groups coming in at that point. It's completely free. It goes from 11 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the morning the next day. And with that, it's a separately um, program to... Um,
Louise, I've just noticed your microphone is off. Oh, yeah. No, here we go. Beg your pardon. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are very open about the way we conduct our affairs. And when we have, the, the council has the ability to have two representatives on our board, including one representative of the audit committee, which we offer in good faith, just to doing what we do and how it works. We're not Mr. Spread Unity through life. We want to do that to the very best of our ability. Great, thank you. Can I ask one tiny. Um, it, it was well known that the, the building was in a you know a terrible state, and I know that the backstage area really didn't do justice to any of the sort of acts that we would want to come to our city. Does it? Have you had feedback from agents and management about what you know what it's looking like now, and whether they're more likely to come as a result? No, no, um, we I haven't in. in in all fairness, I haven't done yet because those bits aren't quite finished yet, but they will be in a couple of weeks. Um, demand um, for space, I'm sure. I mean, I was the person that had to welcome you know, world stars into the back, backstage dressing rooms at Bristol Beacon, and it was not a pleasant experience for, for them, le uh, even less than for me. So um, not yet, but I'm confident that we will. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I note that the 30th of November is St Andrew's night, so I'm hoping there's going to be a piper to welcome everyone to this event. Um, my questions have probably rather been answered so far, but I do have a question about our representation on the BMT board, which I believe we are in, have a, uh, entitled to two members, but I'm not sure we've got the full complement off, and also the new arrangement well, I believe it's a new arrangement to have someone on the Audit Risk and Resource Committee. So if you're not at full complement of those, are there moves afoot to get that in place from the off? I can confirm there are, and we will be looking to get those arrangements um, in place, hopefully in time for the first board meeting after the opening. But we're, we're talking to the administration just to confirm that right now. But absolutely, given the significant investment, um, yes, we know board members have a fiduciary duty to the interests of the organisation, but it's entirely appropriate for whoever sits on those boards to also remember that they need to protect the council's investment. So I think there's no conflict or contradiction between those things, and so we will be taking both seats, and those will be important roles, as will the role on the audit committee. What? <laughs> Councillor Wilcox, you can have the last question and then we're going to move on to the next item. Councillor Brown has asked the question that I wanted to ask. That's it, isn't it? That. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, just say thank you to John, James and Louise for coming along. Um, I think some of us will be on the, there on the November the 30th. If I did get my invite. <laughs> yes. Clearly, clearly, there was something in, in, in the system that didn't want me to go, but, didn't. but I will be there. Um, look forward to it, and also look forward to um, it being a successful event, both now and going forward, because I've, it was a lot of public money, and we do need to see some of that coming back, and also, but also to see the benefit it has across the city as well. So thank you very much for coming along. Um, Stephen, I think you're leaving us as well. Um, agenda item number eight is City Leap. Um, I'm going to move out of the way in a moment, um, and then I'm going to pass over to the other Anderson. They're not related, honestly. <laughs> yeah. John's staying with us as well, and we also got the cabinet member, Councillor Kai Dad, as well. So uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so 
as, as you said, Councillor does here as the as a cabinet member. Um, very happy to hand over to you, Kai, if there's anything you want to say by way of introduction. Um, I'd just say Pete and I here as the strategic client leads, um, but uh, obviously Kai's here as the cabinet member. Um, yeah, no, I'm just, um, I had a chat with Pete, so I'm just uh, beforehand, so I'm happy for, for Pete to sort of drive the presentation and I'm happy to deal with any questions that come my way in terms of any of the um, more political questions or, um, well, or anything I can help with really, but um, Pete, Pete's in charge of this one really tonight. Nice to see everybody. I think we saw each other recently on the on the waste briefing. Um, got apology from Helen Reid, uh, who many of you will know, who's the who was solicitor for City Leap, who is um, really poorly today, so she couldn't make it. I was trying to get a live feed through, but um, unfortunately she's not making it. Um, good news: Helen was the lead solicitor of City Leap, and she was very interested in the client manager role in the council that was set up. So as we go into the slides, we talk more about the client. Um, the client team. Helen was successful in securing the um, head of service for client teams. So that's brilliant. So that continuity from the mobilisation through to the award, through to what's in the concession agreement is great. And um, really pleased that Helen's leading the client team. Um, I think you've, the, the, the deck's already been shared, and there's a number of slides at the start of the deck which do rehearse and do cover off quite a lot of information which you would have been cited for before, which I know we, I came to us on as we're going through pre-award and mobilisation. Oh, the only sorry. thing I'll say is uh, Councillor Rippleton is, is new to the committee and Councillor Smith, Councillor Brown and Councillor Townsend are relatively new. So and that was why I included them in the deck, um, <laughs> just because I thought there'd be some context there in terms of what, we, what we've done. Um, but if we just, I mean, you drive, you drive in. Yeah. So this won't be new for all of us, I'm sure. Um, but it was just to remind people where we are um, in terms of what we've done. Um, yeah, keep going. And I think in terms of just reminding ourselves in terms of what we did award, it was a 20-year concession with um, um, an aspiration and a commitment of 1.1 billion of low-energy carbon infrastructure in the city. Um, that third bullet point in relation to investment to date and leverage the local knowledge we also wanted to just remind everybody, if you weren't aware, that as part of the stand-up of Bristol City Leap, which Amoresco um, led as the lead um, um, company within, within partnership with Vattenfell, we two put across 33 of our energy service team, so that expertise that had grown with the development of our infrastructure, particularly heat and our, um, some of our large renewables from the uh, energy from the solar to the wind, um, that team moved across, um, is based in Bristol City Leap, and they've now set up their offices in um, Victoria Street, 101 Victoria Street, which is next door to Temple Street, if you're not aware. So that's great to have that clo close cop proximity. Um, once again, why do we do it? Carbon neutrality, of course, net zero, leadership in this area, but also addressing that climate emergency. And ever since we've started and st set up City Leap, we have got a lot of interest and uh, you may, some of you may be involved in um, conversations with other cities or other areas and a number of councillors have uh, other councillors in contact with myself and I know uh, involved as well and there's environment around reputation and things clearly we know we need to deliver this uh, as well, which, is the, which is our primary focus but there's a lot of interest both internationally and nationally and there's some really interesting work happening um, with, our, with our four city neighbours. So it is 20 years. Um, it is partnering with Vattenfall and Amoresco. Um, and we set it up in January. Um, clearly we needed to get to um, delivery quickly. And the client team was formally set up um, with Helen leading it with a team of five. So we've got a team of five in the client team that are focused on project assurance, program assurance, and ensuring that projects that are going through, and you'll see that I've brought up the life that's got in place to provide that due diligence for many gateway projects, which ultimately does not have the sort of risk in relation to going through uh, those projects that are requiring funds or funds that are linked to pipeline of projects within carbon neutrality and decarbonisation. 
um, and that client team was set up formally probably in May, June when we got that team set up. So um, really good. Then also introduce a gateway process. Um, to draw out five uh, accounts are really important for us in relation to what we expect to see through CityLeap. That focus on our assets, they focus on that first, um, as well as obviously raising the profile of what City is about what City Leap is in its in its city context, but a real strong focus for us to deliver on our um, 2025, particularly in our estate. Um, we focused heavily on our top 30 emitters, on emitters in terms of our assets, um, to which all the surveys have now been con completed. So that is for our big buildings like City Hall, Temple Street, cemeteries, etc. So those surveys have, have been on site. All those surveys have been conducted to understand in terms of what the scope of that those projects could be. Um, the retrofit priority for us in terms of um, social housing, there is a 80 million pound revenue account, which is part of the um, the investment of the fund, which will draw through. Okay. Summarises how you commit the expect in City Leap to to deliver, um, and I wanted to draw out a couple of things to bring you up to speed. Um, we launched the um, Community Energy Development Fund. Um, a few, um, last last month, um, already we've had 37 expressions of interest. Great, um, to read one link to the um, the Woodstock project and the other one linked to Wind, Windmill City Farm. So we are working through to look at what those projects are, and hopefully more will come through. Um, and Fowl and Amoresco have done a lot of work in relation to economic uh, um, skills, and um, there's a schools program being about to be developed by Vattenfell focusing on um, workshops around heat um, networks, heat modelling. And also one of the key areas for us is around supply chains, um, particularly in the heat sector. Um, so there is a supplier day that we are actively promoting um, for the 22nd of November um, to, to generate interest and also to develop um, interest and skills. Yeah. Okay, so what is the client function? Um, so this slide split into two just reminds ourselves in terms of the concession process, so the concession that we've entered into in terms of um, from ideation on the left um, um, through to the uh, various elements of the process linked to the governance that we would expect to see through shareholder as well as what the reporting is. The next couple of slides go into a bit more detail, but this slide here on, on the bottom is called project acceptance. Um, criteria and process able to challenge, I guess, not only our colleagues in relation to the council, who would be the service lead for the right projects come through, but Amoresco and their partners that projects um, are doing as, as what we would want them to be as per the, the bid. Um, uh, hopefully, these are the things that you would expect to see. Um, in relation to a client function in terms of their role in relation to support the core processes of what we're setting up. Mentioned acceptance criteria. There is an annual business plan process um, that I'm sure you'll be familiar with that we would expect the uh, Bristol City League to produce. Um, there is um, value for many expectations. There is a requirement um, annually to conduct an annual independent um, benchmarking report around value for money. Um, and obviously the requirements in there in relation to dispute resolution and planning, depending if that was required or not. Thankfully, to date, we haven't needed that. To focus on the, the middle and the right-hand side on this slide, um, the, the left-hand side explains and pulls out pieces of um, reserve matters and other elements of what we would expect from a shareholder and non-executive um, role in Bristol we have got two seats on the board and the JV Co. Um, one is a part of the council, which is currently being fulfilled by Stephen Peacock, as well as a non-executive director appointed a gentleman called Simon Mellon to um, appoint to be the NED. And MRSCO have two seats on that board. So that is the, the, the construct of the, um, the JV Co. 
We've established an internal meeting that meets every month. Um, we're calling it the De uh, Delivery Implementation Group, um, whereby we review the projects at the gateways to enable us to consider um, and to challenge in relation to senior officers to the projects coming through. Service working groups, um, we've, we've established working groups that are aligned to the projects coming through. So we have a property working group, we have a um, housing working group, and we have a uh, recently established a EV working group. So um, just to ensure that we can make sure that our services and the officers in those services understand, one, what we've done clearly through the concession, but also own the projects that are coming through. Because um, clearly the client function is there to assess, but we do need to ensure that the services are bought in and are doing what we need them to do to ensure that we can deliver quickly and actually get to um, and start date on these projects. So it's a four-stage process before we enter into any contract, and it's really important for us in relation to ensure that as we go through that process, if there are any costs that are being incurred, particularly by Amoresco or Vattenfair, we are confident that we are, understand what those costs are, and as we move into stage two, that if we do um, decide to not proceed beyond stage two, then we would be liable for... Bullet point four on that slide just uh, reiterates that where the council is to put money into um, projects that exceed the key decision threshold of half a million does need to go to cabinet. So um, there is a current pipeline of works, which I'll come on to in a moment, which um, are projects that are already in the pipeline that have been agreed um, by cabinet. So therefore, we're not asking for any new money for cabinet on those projects and any projects coming through the pipeline that does require excess of 500k would go to Cabinet. Okay. So we currently have um, 35 projects um, on, the, on the register on our estate and linked to our assets, and up to our city lead parking um, with city partners, for example, University of um, Bristol and UWE are involved in that, as well as the, um, the police. Hopefully there's no surprise in terms of the, the categories of projects that are coming through. Um, the EV projects are very much the moment around the network. Um, uh, project known as Social Housing and Foundation Fund projects. It's in the value of nine million, 10 million pound that we're nearly at the point of contract, which will be great, which is a retrofit project on our, on our, on our I think there's four or five key blocks. Um, and there's a big pipeline of work we're working through, particularly around retrofit in relation to our housing. Um, in terms of property, as I mentioned, 30 meters, and we're working through those, those, those projects. Work captured in the Erica and Battenfell, um, and we're um, our land in relation to particularly battery storage. We've got a couple of projects in the pipeline there focused on land that could hopefully um, some really opportunities for solar as well as battery storage. In, there isn't any information on um, heat neck work. Unfortunately, I didn't have that information to, to share with you. I'll come back to that one in a moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in relation to um, working with VAT and Fennel, we've got eight schemes at the moment six that we transferred across the heat network um, and there are discovery works happening as we speak in around locations of temporary energy centres and energy centres in relation to future expansion um, but we've con they have um, connected up over 31 buildings since award and um, 13 successful retrofit connections and they are looking for another 150 so it is they are actively working on that pipeline and I can share information that I've now got at my disposal, but I didn't want to add it to the slide deck before, so we can share that um, ahead of that. So just to visualise in terms of the breakdown of where the, the project's currently based on, and our, the council on the 2025, that's really, really important to um, adhere to those commitments. 
On the next slide, we bring to your attention a number of current and live bids that we're working on. Um, we've submitted a bid to public sector decarbonisation scheme, which you'll, some of you may be familiar with because it's had many iterations. I think they're on number four now. Um, so we've put a, a bid in there, particularly focused around our offices and Camford Crematory. Uh, Camford does emit 30% of our CO2 emissions, so it is a really, really important focus and really pleased that this is sitting of coming forward with innovation in this space in relation to burners. Um, working with Weka around the road because um, it's focusing green um, charging hubs to street on street and destination. So that's a large piece of work working with Weka and Bristol City Elite. We've secured some capability funding from the um, what, what is known as the Levi Fund um, to enable us to recruit a EV lead for the council, uh, as well as to take forward our EV policy. So that's really important um, as we go down work or do so, but also look at our infrastructure. And the file of leisure team in relation to so there's activity both in project creation as well as um, interesting things happening in relation to the, um, the bid space. So it's really looking at the council's funds. This is very much around the delivery of our projects funded by ourselves, that's in train, but also looking at the development, particularly at large level, where that private financing models will, will, come, to, will come to pass. I think that's... Oh, one more. So in terms of... Um, this plan timeline. So we're just at the process where we've received their refreshed business plan. So they submitted a business plan um, this time last year, and we are working this with their um, draft. So no longer is an opportunity for us and, and colleagues to review their submission for us to analyse it by the Council um, in accordance with the concession agreement um, in, in February. And I think that's the slides. Happy to take any questions. Um. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Um, Kai, do you want to quickly make a comment? Yeah, sorry, I'm take, taking all the uh, question time there. <laughs> so sorry about that. Yeah, just to say, I'm, I'm quite pleased with how, how it's going. I think, in, as Pete said, in January we transferred over, is it 33 members of staff? I was over in the office a couple of week, weeks ago, there's 80 people in, in the office now working on decarbonisation projects across, across the city. And I think given the budget situation of the council, it's clear that we would have never been able uh, to do that and have that number of um, people working on those, on, on those projects. Pete was right to say the, the interest outside of Bristol in this model is like tremendous. I've, I've um, been doing briefings for num numbers of local authorities across the country, but also there's international interest in, in this model is one of the first sort of um, examples of um, a model that the private sector is interested in investing in large scale amounts of um, money in. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of um, interest. And yeah, it's interesting that the, uh, the slide on the, on the bids made, made me laugh a little bit actually because um, we have had some issue with, with issues with some of the grant schemes because it's absolutely outrageous how they're set up. There's, um, public sector decarbonisation fund and the way you win money for that is fastest finger first so it's like trying to bid for Glastonbury tickets and I think we put in a bid and the the, um, the system crashed and there was another bid the uh, uh, the um, so is it the green skills fund yes that's it um, and again that's done on the similar bit so not on the merits of the bid it's fastest fingers finger first and um, I think we missed out on that one and it's just no way, it's no way to run a bidding process or, or a country, in my, my opinion. Thank you, Kai. Councillor Fodor, I've got you first on my list, then Councillor Whippington and Councillor Bradshaw. 
Right, yeah, thank, thanks very much. Really, really helpful to have this. Um, lots of, lots of uh, information that I was, I was sort of keen to see, finally, so excellent. Um, the, the positive side is, is the, the, the sort of growth of activity, and I have been to talk to Battenfall and, and uh, the Amoresco people and at the launch of the Community Fund. And, and one of the things I wanted right from the beginning, like over four years ago, was that we, we do get social value out of it and that the community energy sector, which is particularly strong in Bristol, gets something out of it. And I'm pleased to see those are there. <coughs> so to me, that's, that's like being listened to and that's a success. Slightly more worried about the bidding because with the exception of the, the sort of passing mention of the university and the re large-scale renewables, everything else is a series of public funded opportunities and we had a team in the city they were good at getting those public funds in uh, they're now not in the council they're now somewhere else so we need a client to ask them to do that but all of the things listed here are publicly funded so where's the 400 plus million that's coming which i assumed was mainly going to be private capital yeah, I, I mean, Pete, Pete sorry, go, go it's, it's probably a bad idea having me here, actually. Go, 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 so, um, yeah, the, the, the biggest project, the heat net rollout, roll that, that's, I think, at least a £300 million investment from Vattenfall, and that's the biggest item, and they're, they're going to do that very slow and steady in, in a Swedish style, but they'll, yeah. they'll, get there, they'll, they'll get there in the end. And then the other kind of area where, the, where you will see major private sector investment is around the large-scale renewables. And in the business plan, that comes in sort of um, two or three years down the line. But I think it's important to, you know, I think it's important to get projects through the system as quick, quickly as possible, spend the money that we've got. We don't know what the, you know, the future uh, holds, do we? So we know we've got the money now. So it's, it's, I think it's a good idea that we spend it and we get the supply chain development. We get the, we get the, the, the development of the local workforce um, whilst the... Um, private sector, large-scale private sector investment is coming in sort of year two or year three of the business, business plan. But yeah, the biggest investment, over 300 million, the biggest project is Vattenfall, and that's 100% private investment. But they are also seeking to get grant funding. Obviously, with that, they can do a lot more than they're, they're, they're planning to, they can do with their own money. Just, just to follow up, um, so could we have reports that, that show which parts of the activity are private, privately funded. Because to me, that's the big win. If we've outsourced what we had, it's got to be worth bringing that in rather than the rest of them, which is we, we need to know that the public funding is still going in that was already going in from Wecker and, and from ourselves. So, Ma, so Ma, yeah, so just jump in, I guess what the quick question is, can we, we don't need to see every individual just the breakdown and overall is that would, would you say that's now if, if i may i think that kai said in the business plan that we've received that modeling around years two three four um in relation to that that scale up um i think it's important to note that the expertise in city leap to actually put the bids in is is there so we haven't written them in our on our own um so actually all of those bids that have gone in the expertise have been actually in, worked through from, obviously from Bristol City Leap by, by people they've been able to bring in as well as the people that two bid across. So I think it's important that <clears throat> we, we, you know, we want to identify bids that are new, not only from ourselves, um, but though that, that private model around particularly the large scale will, will come. Um, but that fo I guess it's really important also to utilise the money that we've secured via capital programme um, before that. That, that before that's potentially lost or is um, repurposed, and that delivery of the re decarbonisation fund internally as well as the 80 million is really really important. Um, but Vattenfall and Amresco are fully aware of actually that private finance and those models, and it is in the business plan. Okay. Great, yeah, because I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, I too condemn the fact we're meant to compete against other authorities to get the little share of public money there is, but but we were quite good at it, and we hopefully still will be. Well, we just have to, you just have to have the quickest finger. You don't even need, need to be good. All right, Kai, um, John wants to come in. And also, no, no, right. Can I just also say that 
I do have a lot of people lined up to talk, so can we try and keep the questions as succinct as possible? So sorry, I, I won't say for long. We're just going to give because I think it's a really good question, councillor, and, and we want to see that private investment come in as well, and, and you know, and Kai does and set out the key areas. I think there is other value as well. I mean, you're right. I would completely agree with you. I think we've, we've got some really good people in the council winning bids in all sorts of areas, and they're still doing that as well for us. Um, it is about bringing that ruthless focus on delivery as well, I have to say. So that's where we're really hoping to see that value uh, in terms of delivering this. There's a big amount of work to be done here. And I think we're already seeing through the structures that we've got that sort of testing and challenging and you know, can the council departments work up and join it and then bring that expertise in to deliver? So I think it is about that as well as the investment, which we also want to see. And the only thing I'll just add to that is we are facing a very difficult budget and it may not be the case that those people, if they were still employed by the council. So, Councillor Rippenton. Yeah, thanks. Um, just two quick questions. One is... Um, one is there, or could there be, or will there be, uh, a kind of a, any kind of interactive map that could show us where in the city um, city leap projects are happening, and who's who's doing them, and 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 you know maybe how much they cost as well. I think that'd be a really useful thing to that you could see to see now where we are, and and in five years' time, you know where all these things have gone, where all the money has gone, and what it's delivered. That would be really good. Um, the other question I'm going to ask uh, may be a stupid question because I've not been on here long enough to have been at previous briefings. But so, Amresco, if they if they invest four hundred and odd million pounds, they're obviously expecting to to get a return on that investment. Um, how do they get that return on that investment? And do we, as a fifty percent partner in Bristol City Leap, do we see some return on on that as well? I think to your first question, yes, we, we haven't got it at the moment, but we've got all that information at our disposal in terms of what I've, seen, what I've got in front of me here that you haven't got around the heat network in terms of, the, in terms of how that's modelled and where that is profiled. We could definitely turn that into something that is then not only usable for the public um, because the yes, is the Bristol City Elite website, which has lots of information and stuff that we can lay onto that. So I'll take that away with with the team. In terms of um, your second question around, um, I guess, return of investments, wasn't it, in terms of what we would see? I think the 424 does include, that initial bid did include our 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 projects, um, so that's important. Um, and let me hand over to Kai, because I've just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the return on investment, so the, the joint venture company, which is 50-50, we've got 50% of the vote, Amoresco's got 50 but does the project development and it um, agrees the business plan, but each project will have a different return. So, for example, the heat network, that's 100% of the investment coming from Vattenfell. They're taking all the risk. They have to sign up the customers. They're building all the pipes. They, they get all the reward. But what we get is the um, decarbonisation that they're delivering for us. We get all the social value, the jobs they're creating. Um, um, another example would be the um, sort of HRA projects. So we've got 80 million in, um, in, in the 30 year business plan for, um, to get everything to an EPCC. So in that, in that aspect, they'll, they'll act as the contractor at Amoresco and they'll get a contractor's profit from the work, but we would have needed a contractor anyway to, to do that work. And then the renewable energy projects, we might have um, wind turbines ho hosted on our land. Um, so we'll, at the very least, we'll get a, um, a, a, a rental income from the land but we may choose to invest in that project ourselves and get a return as an investor. Or we might have some sort of profit share arrangement. Um, but obviously, yeah, that will be done on, you know, it's, each project is, will, will have its own makeup. I think it's case by case basis mm. is what. Yeah. Pete. There is a model to look at contingency overheads risk. And, the, you know, the concession agreement was written very much like a development agreement rather than construction agreement in terms of where that risk lies. And the reason for us, to do, you know, in entering the concession was for Amoresco and to Vatsvel to yes to build that within their budget, budget proposals, but for us to then be able to demonstrate, you know, challenge on value for money in relation to where they would be taking 
their, their share in terms of the project, depending on what the type of the project was. And I think it's really important for us to look at that, and we do that by the project acceptance criteria. And to look at it, we, we talk about looking at it from a portfolio approach rather than project to project in terms of where the gain or the benefit is in relation to where the, the margins are from the bids that are coming through. Um, and that's really important for us to, to challenge back. Um, yeah. Councillor Bradshaw. So I welcome this update. Um, just an extension of what uh, Tim said, I think it's really important that where there are interventions on the street in localities that they're properly and fully branded as being part of City Leap. It's important that people can see and understand what is going on. Perhaps underneath, you know, the road or whatever it might be, that, that that's really important. I've got a number of very quick points that I'm going to reel off. The first is uh, the governance of the JV and the NEDs who sit on the board. Is that connected to the shareholder group? Is that, is, is that part of the general array of governance around our city-owned companies? That's point one. Point two is, uh, I note the point that was made about skills. Does that include construction jobs and installation skills, working with the city college and other institutions in the city? Because that's really important. Um, when I was more closely involved in the heat network side of things, we were very preoccupied by the number of connections that we were able to make because that's obviously ongoing with revenue. Pleased to hear there's been a growth in that, but particularly interested to learn how much of that is coming through the planning system and whether there's more that ought to be done through the planning regime and the decision making around planning just, just to get more connections in place. And, and I suppose I'm relieved, and this is more of a general point, not necessarily a question, relieved that the national uh, uh, policy around decarbonisation, which is somewhat confused at the moment, doesn't seem to be having an impact on this very important programme. I'll come in quickly on that uh, job. Yeah, you always, yeah, often always right, um, Mark. So, um, but I'll come in uh, on the jobs uh, question. So, part of the social value commitment was that the uh, over the next five years. A thousand jobs would be created via this investment, but at least 410 of them have to be in the Bristol postcode area. Um, and actually, it's not. Um, I always thought the biggest barrier to tackling climate change was actually getting the investment in. We've, we've kind of got that now. The next biggest challenge is that supply chain, the lack of skilled workforce, and it's very much a part of the um, the, the joint ventures' uh, role and Amoresco's role to develop that local supply chain. And I think the fact that it's a 20-year partnership, as opposed to say, like a you know, we might have had a contract in previous years for a one-off, you know, rollout of solar panels that lasted 18 months. They know they're going to be around for a long time, so they're willing to invest in in the supply chain and developing those jobs. Whereas um, you know, the previous arrangements we had, why would they? Because what you're going to, you know, what's going to happen after they, you know, you finish the job. So um, yeah. Yeah, if I can, um, in terms of the in terms of governance, it, it, the the company's team do support je the the ourselves as in terms of a client team to ensure about the appointments of the the NED and ensuring that they provide the support whenever as and when needed from a legal perspective. Um, but I must say the 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 JV Co meets every other month, um, and it and it and there's been no conflict or um, dispute resolution required. Um, and it seems to be working very well, which is good. Um, but the company's team do are part of that equation, and we do and we do report into the um, the company's board, the insurance board. Um, so we do that. In terms of the in terms of the skills, it is both heat, energy, boiler, construction, and that supplier day is going to be one of. Well, that's the first one, but that's something that we need to build upon. Close relationships with the city of College Bristol that Amresco made during mobilisation and now. And then very important for us, that link in with Jane Taylor in our employment and skills team and trying to unlock opportunity through WECA in terms of the access to funds that WECA hold in relation to employment and skills as well as opening up opportunities with, with Jane. Planning, um, the, we're working with Simone and the planning team to ensure that we don't slow down and that we look at how can we ensure that 
we, they, they, as in Amoresco and Vattenfall, can get that timely response. And we were talking around enhanced agreements to ensure that we can, they can get what they need at the right time. Um, and yeah, so that, I think the relationships are going quite well. Um, but it is, it's the challenges faced around what was previously our highway, which we could go in, and of course now it's not a highway, but how do we actually navigate that? So I think there's been some really useful con conversations in terms to, to do things to do things and to do things right, but that doesn't hold up wherever we can. So I hope that answers your question. Councillor Gollop. There's something about Councillor right. Gollop and microphones today. Seems to be. Um, I, I was worried about my ward colleague asking the same questions I wanted to ask, but I think Councillor Rivington needs to be really worried because you know, Tim's asked questions that I was asking when this was first presented to us about the profit that Amoresco were making out of this. Um, if you look at the, if you look at Amoresco's accounts on their website, they they look to make uh, eighteen and a half that's uh, right between nineteen and a half and twenty percent gross profit. So that would mean on a four forty five million pound investment, they'd expect to be making eighty four point five five million pound profit. So I, I think we just need to we need to be aware of that in the context of what we're talking about. But I was I was actually going to address things on a more micro level um, in terms of business planning. The slide that was put up, uh, and I, I start off by saying I recognise this is very different to Bristol Waste Company business plan where we own 100% of the company and we control it completely. I recognise this is 50% of a joint venture where we're employing experts to operate the process. So I, I know it's different. Um, but I was intrigued by the present by the slide, which talked about the business plan going to council in mid February. The only mid February council meeting is budget council, and I just want clarification because if if the city leap business plan is going to full council as part of the budget papers, it won't be looked at. Can I go just double chair? Is it for council or cabinet? It's a shareholder decision. So when I say by two, by yeah. yeah, sorry, probably the wrong, right. not the best word in uh, so, Councillor Gollop. So, so it's not going to full council, it's a shareholder decision. Um, but we are, uh, as part of the concession agreement, it's, part, it's not a full council decision. So that follows on to the, the, the next question that scrutiny gets a briefing but isn't even allowed a public meeting. Well, now, I, I think it should be a public scrutiny meeting where comments can be closed doors, particularly given the shell closed doors, and therefore there's no public engagement whatsoever. Uh, I'll, we'll go through the process. Um, uh, obviously, there'll be the scrutiny process. Um, let, let us come back to you, mm. Councillor Gorp. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope I'm expressing views others would share. It's not that, and I recognise it's not that we can have any say because it's a decision made by the management of the company. But, but I think that, that the council is missing an opportunity to promote what it's doing in a public meeting, which is open to scrutiny. So, so that's, mm. that, that's and, 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 and I think then it's questions about what is key decisions. Now you've in a sense answered that, it's not treated as a key decision. If there are investment decisions, they would be treated as key decisions. I must admit, I would like to see a business plan of this significance being treated as a key decision because it affects all wards in the city. And therefore, I would see that even if it was only going to cabinet for ratification, 
I would see that that again was a way of achieving appropriate public engagement. So, uh, but, but thank you for taking that on board. But I, yeah. but I, no, but as you say, Councillor Cobb, any key decisions would come to cabinet in the normal way anyway. Yeah. But, but, but what I'm saying is, it, it, it is but the definition of key decision is one that affects all wards and, um, and therefore it potentially is a key decision in that sense. And I must admit my notes weren't thinking along the lines of an interactive map, but that's probably a reflection of my age. Uh, but I was thinking that it would be really useful to know more detail about the projects. I realise they're commercial and sensitive. So I'm not asking for anything that gives the game away, but the list that's given there is so generic is not to really tell us anything. And, and it would be useful to know a bit more about the detail because I think there's a good story to tell and I think therefore you ought to be expanding that detail to, to tell it. But also from a ward member perspective, it is good to know what is going on in or adjacent to our individual wards. That's a, that's that's a story that we can share. Uh, but if it's all if it if it's all done in a slightly secretive way, it's not it's not actually promoting. And I would have seen promoting is a good way of actually tapping up potential sources of other investment as well. Without that, you're not going to be attracting attention as much as you could. Okay, I'm, I'll actually respond to that because um, I think the first thing to say is. We're still, there are still discussions being aired about what's going to be coming um, in terms of the business plan to OSM and how much of that will be in public session and how much will need to be in exempt session. Um, also, just to clarify, I think what Jeff's point was about key decisions, they're not just defined by a financial number. So it's not just if it's above 500,000, it's also if it affects multiple wards as well. So there may be some cases where a key decision might be below 500,000, but if it affects multiple wards, it's still seen as being the key decision. And I think the other point that Jeff has made is about, you know, the city leap is very important and ward councillors can be partners in helping to promote that as well. Would you say that was fair enough, Jeff? Yeah. Thank you, Tony. I mean, it, it, the say, it sounds to me like this is a, it's a, it is a positive story. It's engaging. It's achieving. But don't, you know, I, I accept we can't go into all the detail. I wouldn't expect to know all the detail. But I think, I think we need to find a way of promoting more to, to actually let our residents know. And say one is funding in, but the other is making people more aware of the initiatives they might be supporting themselves. So all sorts of reasons to do it more openly and also i think you know, what we'll be aware of is as we move into the committee model we may have to do some things differently okay yeah well i think the, in that model the sh where the shareholder decision sits is quite key isn't it to the company go and I don't, i'm like i say i've not I've, not I've not been on the committees of committees so i don't know if you've had any discussions about shareholder functions and things like that but obviously that's going to be quite key to this relationship Going Some discussions have been held, but um, this is Osmond rather than committee model working group. But what I will say is that one of the key things about a committee model working group is that no single decision can be delegated to any individual councillor. It has to be. We can discuss in more detail, but that's one of the elements of a committee model. You can't delegate decision making to one individual councillor. Um, Thanks, Jeff. I'm going to move on to your partner in crime, Councillor Steve Smith. Thank you. Um, uh, the fact, thank you for that. I, I think the first briefing I ever went to as a brand new councillor was about City Leap, and I've been to several since. And I think, for the first time, I actually understand what it is. Um, so thank you. <laughs> um, I, I've got one question left that nobody else has asked, but I, I just want to comment. Um, Pete, you talked about planning and trying to avoid delays. And I get that, um, but I get daily emails from my residents who also want a timely response to their planning applications. And I'd be a bit disappointed if I found out that Amoresco was jumping the queue and delaying my residents' planning applications as well. So, I, Completely. Fine. Um, the one question I, 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 that I still don't quite understand is where the, the private sector partners are investing in building assets, the heat network, probably the biggest one. Um, 
more and more buildings have been connected to the heat network. If I live in an apartment in one of those buildings, I can't go and buy my energy on the open market. I've got to buy heat from Vattenfall. So in the absence of competition, what control is there over what they charge me for that heat? Because that's how they're getting a return on their yeah, that's, 300 million quid. I mean, the, um, I, I, I think regulation will come, but there is no national regulation around heat networks at the moment. So what we've contractually signed up with, with Vattenfall is the heat trust standard, standard around transparent pricing. And we also say, for example, if you're in a block that's managed by a, a management company, we, we um, ensure that they stand up, sign up to those standards as well. So it's then passed on to the residents. So we, we're in effect kind of the, um, the regulator locally um, until there's national, national regulation. So is this a kind of, um, oh, well, I'm not going to call it Soviet, that's not fair, but are, 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 we, are we doing price control here, event, essentially? Um, there's count, like counterfactuals that it's got to be comparable to and things like So there's um, sort of um, agreed... Mm. Um, ways of doing it that the uh, consumer protection organisation, the Heat, the Heat Trust, are um, you know they, they're they're saying that we're doing it in the right way. So and we're we're signed up to their standards. But it would help if there was national regulation because I think um, heat networks are going to become more prevalent. So we need to ensure that 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 consumer protection legislation is sort of um, on the books uh, nationally as well. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Brown. Um, I had two questions. Uh, one at the back of the slide, which talked about the projects, um, and you talked about stage one and stage two costs. If they're incurred by Amoresco, or uh, we, um, we have to pick those up. By we, did you mean Bristol City Council? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, I had was on the value slides. Uh, there's talk about um, opportunity crowdfunding up to 10% of capital investment requirements of non heat network projects. Now, you didn't mention that. I just wondered if you could give us a little bit more information on what that's about. Yeah, so that's, um, that was part of Amsco's winning uh, tender that. Um, they, uh, they would um, offer the opportunity of up to 10% of the capital raised to be um, raised through crowdfunding. And I think the, the idea that they're coming around is to do that on a project by project basis. And they'll sort of have a campaign around a certain, you know, if it's a wind turbine, they'll have a campaign around it to raise the, the capital locally. Um, and we're also going to make that platform available to the community energy sector as well when they're developing their own projects I've, I've, we we've got a part uh, um there's a partner that's coming come in to um work with city leap on that i don't can we can we because i can I we know. say who they are i don't i, I don't know i don't know i better better air on the uh cautious yeah. side then but uh, yeah we, there's a sort of a a partner that's got a, a good reputation in crowdfunding and things like that that were coming and that will be announced in due course i think i can say it but i'm i'm who they are but i'll hear i'll hear on the side <laughs> of caution given that we're in a, a public meeting can I also just Andrew's point about um, accepting the project, but they have to. It's only projects that are part of the project acceptance criteria that we've already agreed as part of the deal, isn't it? I mean, they can if they want to do something outside of what we agreed with them to do. Then we purely, purely, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it was you know to ensure that there was a responsibility back to us. You know, if we were to change direction, then and they've incurred costs up to that point on a project that's gone through the gateway processes, then. We would need to, you know, we shouldn't be getting to stage two uh, before we go into contract. So, yeah. Andrew, did you have? Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, so, just coming back to the crowdfunding thing, um, what would be the quid pro quo for someone who wanted to contribute to the crowdfunding? Is it just the, you know, the opportunity to have a nice, warm, fuzzy glow about contributing to green energy, or yeah, I think there's something more substantial? Of people locally that want, you know, that. I mean, obviously, we've got a lot of people that are struggling in Bristol, but there are people with money that want to invest their money into um, uh, projects that were, you know that are a force for good, and so they'll get they'll get a return, like a steady return. It won't be great, but it's it's the knowledge that they've invested in a certain project locally. I think so. We'll see how that goes. Um, um, yeah, we'll see how many people out there are willing to to invest via via that route. But I think I think you'll be surprised. Councillor Wilcox. 
Thank you, Chair. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, there is a lot of poor quality 1950s housing stock that the council owns with very low EPC ratings, mm -hmm. energy ratings. What time scale do we expect to see an improvement in those in that housing and stock? So when will we start seeing the upgrades? Yeah, so the commitment is to get to um, everything at least an EPCC by 2030. Um, I think Pete's already mentioned there's projects ongoing and we're bringing a social house in decarbonisation paper to, I think, the February, February cabinet. February cabinet which will outline a, bit, a major investment in some of the, some of the key projects. Um, but we're also trying to maximise the, you know, the amount of grant funding we can get in from, from government as, as, as well, because um, with our own mo money alone, it won't, won't be enough. And it's about 10,000 properties, so we've got 27,000. Uh, it's 10,000, the equivalent of 10,000 properties that we need to get up to a EPCC. Thank you for that. And I'd like to ask, uh, expand on the governance questions that have been coming up. Um, you've appointed a non-executive director, who I assume is not just some random person on the street and has experience of um, this sort of project. No, David, we just went for somebody who was a random person on the street. <laughs> well, I'll take you at that word, Tony. Um, so how does this non-executive director integrate with members? So how do we actually feed in uh, about the way that we want this joint venture to work in that process, please? That's, that's one for me, apparently. Um, it's a good question. I mean, uh, so I, I actually, uh, we didn't mention this before, but briefly, I was the director, yeah. actually, <laughs> on the board because um, uh, Stephen, at that stage, was the executive director for Growth and Regen, who's the senior client representative. And then when Stephen became chief executive, I became executive director. So we, we swapped, so I couldn't do it then. But um, um, so, I mean, I, I've met um, the, uh, the non-executive director. He's very knowledgeable and capable in these areas. Um, if, if that's OK, Councillor, I'll take that away and have a think about in terms of the process and how we can work into it. And I'll discuss it with, with the chief executive. So. Um, they meet regularly, so it's Stephen and the non-executive director who attend the board. Uh, and, you know, there's certainly pre-meets that happen between the two of them, and they agree that. I, I don't, in, in the client world, we don't interface directly with, with that director because they have independent director responsibilities. But, um, but yeah, well, if, if that's okay, I'll take away and, and probably talk to the monitoring officer about, about that. Particularly in the light of the committee model, because I think it's, we don't want to start off one working relationship and then have to rebuild it completely. And that's, that's an issue for all the companies, isn't it? How, how that shareholder function that sits with the mayor, which I think is delegated to Craig Cheney at the moment, how, mm -hmm. how, that, how, that has, how does that continue? in the committee system. I don't, yeah, like I say, I don't know if you've even, even discussed it. Uh, no, at Osden, but it's yeah. going to be discussed at audit um, because the audit is responsible for governance issues, uh, not Osden. We're just responsible for criticising everything else. Um, Christine, did you have your hand up? Sorry, I missed you earlier. And that's my first question. The question is in relation to the project. It's all, it's all, it's all kind of, kind, kinds of jobs, really. So um, if you if you think about it, um, yeah, obviously you're, good jobs. yeah, you're thinking about, I'm talking about the good jobs. yeah. So there's there's going to be loads of good, you know, retro, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, retro installers of retro, f um, you know, uh, the building fabric. There's good, and all, all the back office jobs and so. Where those are going to be offered and who's going to be targeted for getting those jobs and how you're going to 
language. Yeah, so, so, is so that they're more inclusive and less gender. Or yeah, so, so, yeah, so, um, Bristol City Leap's um, contractually ob obliged to provide that 410 uh, jobs in the in the Bristol postcode area. That's either directly or through the uh, supply chain and subcontractors. Um, they've they've also got any e um, responsibilities around um, uh, an EDI strategy as well. Um, and we're also working in partnership with existing um, sort of skills. Is it building Bristol, the current um, construction industry? scheme that Jane Taylor runs um, here. But I, I agree with you, it is, a, it is an opportunity to uh, change some of the demographics, um, um, you know, in, uh, you know, that you might see in the construction